bit about what interventional radiologists do, generally all the sort of different cases that we treat. And then I'm going to talk a bit more about the cases that we treat with people with liver cancer and what treatments we've got to offer them. So what is interventional radiology? I'm not really sure my wife knows after 12 years of happy marriage. And many people in the public don't really know. The media hasn't really got a handle on it. And many doctors don't, don't know either, to be honest. So inter interventional radiology is really surgery, but without a knife. And instead, of, you've heard of keyhole surgery. We do sort of pinhole surgery. We make a tiny little nick um, in, say, the groin. Give lots of local anesthetic. And we just put a needle into the artery in the groin. And from there, we can access anywhere in the body to deliver treatments. So we use often sort of ultrasound to guide our needle to, to start the treatments. Um, and then we use live x-rays. So I'm glowing like the ready Breck man when I get home. Because we're using live x-rays to guide catheters and wires around the body to do these treatments. So interventional radiology really is a rapidly evolving specialty. And it provides an alternative to open surgery, but often as a day case and often under local anaesthetic, and it has a very much lower complication rate and uh, mortality rate than open surgical alternatives. So it's very well tolerated by patients, and patients really like it. And we can treat patients, doesn't matter if they're young, old, large, small, we can treat any comers, really. So it all started back in 1953 with a Swedish a uh, radiologist called Ivan Svel uh, Seldinger who worked out that if you put a needle into a vessel or a tube of any sort in the body then you could put a wire through that needle, take the needle off and then over the wire thread various devices to do treatments. So that was in 1953 he figured that out. But it wasn't for 10 years till an American guy called Charles Dotter who was known locally as Crazy Charlie who described himself as a body plumber, which is the wrenches and things that you've spotted earlier on. So he, just, he described himself as a body plumber, and he worked out that he'd be able to fix, he initially did it for people with arterial problems in their legs, so narrow, furring up of the arteries, you'll all have heard of that sort of thing. <clears throat> and he worked out that he'd be able to treat narrowings in the arteries in the legs through the artery itself from the inside rather than do a bypass or an amputation or anything like that. So he managed to put a little needle in the, this patient's groin who had no alternative other than amputation and managed to pass little um, dilators over a wire through a narrowing that you can see here. And then he got rid of the narrowing essentially, cleared the pipes, the blood could get down the leg better and the patient could walk again and didn't need an amputation, and it was fantastic. And that's what in interventional radiology was really born from that. The vascular surgeons at the time were so suspicious of this newfangled treatment that they kept the patient in hospital for three weeks just to check nothing terrible was going to happen. But from this early success, interventional radiology has blossomed over time. So that was 50 odd years ago, so what's been happening since then? Well, a lot's happened in the last 50 years. There's been a sort of technological revolution. We've gone from telephones, just as one example, I was looking at a 1950s, 1960s telephone on the internet, which didn't exist at the time. And it looks like this. And then I looked at my own smartphone where you can take pictures, movies, you know, surf the internet and make calls. So things have really marched on. And it's the same really in healthcare. And in radiology, I know when I started radiology, which was only in you know, uh, 19, what was it, 2003, we were looking at lots of plain films and films. We had bits of film all over the place, light boxes on the wall. I've still got light boxes on the wall in my office. But you have lots of these, you're putting films up all over the place trying to work out what's going on. Whereas nowadays, it's completely different. There's no films at all anymore. The light boxes are redundant and you just put pictures of your family and things on them. <laughs> Um, and it's all on computer on these PAX workstations nowadays. And you can just scroll through thousands of images and really work out what's going on. And it's been, you know, amazing. And we can now sort of diagnose things that we'd never have diagnosed 
you know, decades before where they didn't have this sort of imaging and this sort of uh, advancement. So imaging, as well as the computer side of things, imaging itself has made absolute leaps and bounds over that time. In the 1950s and 60s, there was x-ray only. That was it, basically. Um, now we have ultrasound, which we can use to guide uh, our needle into a blood vessel or bile duct in the liver or anything like that in real time. So we actually hit it just at the right place. I can just show you a little example of that. This is a needle. This is the blood vessel here. And this is me advancing a little guide wire down a blood vessel. In real time, you can see that as you do it, which is absolutely fantastic. And a real advancement over what we had before. It means you can be very accurate. So in addition, we have CT, which never existed. Um, and that's, even when I started, CT was very slow, blocky, the pictures you got looked a bit like CFAX. Um, and nowadays, you know, the CTs come on in leaps and bounds. You're getting amazing pictures, like this is a picture of somebody, if you looked at the front of them at their liver, this is their liver. And you can see it, there's a tumor in this patient's liver that I treated very recently. Um, CT has really come on and that's enabled us to really diagnose patients' problems with liver disease and with many other forms of, of illness. That's X-ray based CT. So we all also have magnet based imaging with MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and that gives absolutely exquisite pictures. You can see this is as if you'd slice somebody's head like this and you're looking at the side of it. You get an incredible picture of the brain the spinal cord and what have you. And also, same again, liver, you can see that absolutely beautifully on MRI. But that uses a very, very powerful magnet to MRI. So you've got to be very careful that when you go in for an MRI scan, and they'll do, if you ever, if you ever go in for an MRI scan, there's a big checklist that they make sure that um, you haven't got any metal objects on you and that sort of thing. There's a magnet. And here's what can happen. Can you see that? This is somebody who's accidentally taken a wheelchair into the MRI scanner and it's taken off and flown and hit the magnet and just sat where the patient would normally sit for their scan. So you've got to be very careful. It's a hugely powerful magnet. That's the missile effect. Can I ask you about uh, tattoos, Peter? Sorry? Can I ask you about tattoos that um, there was... Tattoos. Tattoos. The story was that the, the old tattoos... I don't think it's got to be, John. <laughs> <laughs> you know, had during the war had metal in the inks and they couldn't have an MRI. Oh, right. They're having some kind of shielding on it. Gosh, right. I don't know if that's true. I, I don't think that forms part of our checklist anymore, tattoos. <laughs> we want to... Pacemakers, <laughs> things like that. That's you know, what we're interested like in. Tattoos, <laughs> you could fly towards the scanner yeah. with you, <laughs> pulled by your tattoo. He's not wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. But you've got to be careful because if people take an oxygen cylinder in and that takes off, that's got some weight behind it. And someone has died because they've been hit by an oxygen cylinder flying through the, flying through the room. Not in this trust, of course. Mm -hmm. Is that dental work, you know, sort of not regular fillings, amalgam fillings and things like that? No, we don't. I mean, they're so common. That would, if that was a... If that was a problem with MR, MR would be finished, I think. Every single patient. Yeah. Yeah. But you've got to take your watch off. It'll never work again. You're going with your watch off. So, interventional radiology, which is a sort of... Um, it's like, as Mr. French once put it to me, you're like a mini-surgeon, really. I've always remembered that. But uh, we're like radiologists, so we use, we use imaging to do procedures. And what we do is we use the Selzinger technique. So we put a little needle into, it's usually the groin, under ultrasound guidance. And then through that we thread a little wire, we take the needle off, and then we put in an access tube. And from there we can feed in these various catheters and wires. And we can go from the groin down here, and we can go pretty well anywhere else, anywhere in the body. 
So a lot of the treatments I'm going to talk to you about today, the transarterial treatments, so the ones through the artery, would actually go in from the groin and up into the liver artery and map the tumours in the liver and give them treatment directly to the tumour. And that's very well tolerated as a patient because you're not getting a whole body treatment, you're just getting the treatment very targeted at the tumour itself. We have, in the same way that lots of technology companies develop computers and scanners and all the rest of it, we have fantastic um, medical device companies that develop all the different bits of kit that make our job possible. So we have balloons that we can use to widen narrowed arteries or what have you. And these, even these are advancing in that you can get little razor blades on the inside of them to open up very tight narrowings. Um, or drug, drug coating on them to stop the narrowings recurring. It's always, you know, these things, five years ago, you have one thing and then it moves on and then they come up with some, a new thing that adds some value to the treatments. We've got stents that we can use that hold open either bile ducts that are narrowed or blood vessels that are narrowed or blocked. We have all these different fancy catheters. These ones can go down to, I, I use one frequently for the liver treatments that's 0.6 of a millimetre wide. You know, it's absolutely tiny, this thing, and you can get it right out into vessels one millimeter in diameter, right out in the liver. It's a fantastic kit that we've got these days. We, have, we can block vessels, so we can put these little particles down these catheters, and it silts up the blood vessels. And so if you have a bleeding patient or you're treating a liver tumor, we can actually silt up the tumor's blood supply so it kind of responds and what have you and various other devices that we'll go through. I just want to very quickly run through some of the cases outside of the liver that we do, and then I'll go on to the liver-directed treatments after that, if that's okay. So broadly speaking, we can sort of unblock vessels that are blocked, or tubes, like bile ducts, or mend blood vessels that are torn from the inside without the need of an operation. So. This is something, I've done this three times today, this sort of procedure. So this is very frequent that we do this sort of thing. But this is somebody's leg, and this is their artery in their leg behind their knee. And can you see there's a little bit here that's pinched? It's a bit narrowed. So the blood is not getting down that artery fast enough for the patient to walk a distance. So after, say, 50 yards, that patient would have to stop because they get pain. So what we do is we just put a little wire down and stretch up, you can see here, there's a darker line here. That's the balloon that we've stretched up this narrowing. And then afterwards we take another picture and it's much, much wider. So there's much more blood getting down that artery so the patient can walk a good distance. So that's something that we do, it's called angioplasty. We do it very frequently. We can also unblock veins. Now this, I'll ask Dr. Mr. French what he, what do you, what do you think this is? <laughs> so this is the heart. This is a patient with really marked head and neck swelling, awful head and neck swelling. And this can often be due to cancer, not necessarily liver cancer, but other cancers. Um, and this is a vein that should be there in the chest, but isn't there returning blood to the heart. So this patient, all this blood's trying to come back from the, head and, the patient's head and arms and can't get through. So you get lots of head swelling, arm swelling. It's really horrible for the patient. But we can quite easily go through and just stretch this up and make that tube again so we can get the drainage from the head and uh, arms right through back into the heart and beyond and all the swelling goes down. And this is one of the nicest treatments that we can give. It's lovely because you see a patient. I'll show you this picture. This is the same person 24 hours later. So this is... Head and neck swelling, it's absolutely horrible. They feel awful. And then you go and see, and I've, I've done this, you know, probably 10, 15 times. Um, and you go up to the ward to see the patient the next day and you walk past them because they don't look anything like they did the day before. We, we uh, take part of an on-call rotor and we're called out. Um, you know, we can be called out 24 hours a day and the sort of things we're called out for are patient with, patients with bleeding, so bleeding emergencies, which can be anything from trauma to bleeding from the bowel or liver or wherever. We often get called out to come and treat these patients. 
because we can do it without need for general anaesthetic. The patients can be very unwell and we can still go ahead and treat them. So this is just an example of us mending an artery that's broken. So this is a CT showing somebody has been stabbed in their sh shoulder area. They're bleeding lots and lots. We've done an angiogram that shows all this. This is this big blob here is just blood escaping from the artery while we're taking the picture. So this patient's bleeding very rapidly. And we can just put a little needle, uh, a little wire past this area of damaged, ripped blood vessel and put a little stent that just holds open this area um, and kind of relines the blood vessel from the inside, stops the bleeding straight away. So that's just what... Are the stents left in permanently? The know. stents, are, yeah. Yeah. They don't have to renewed after a length of time? No, no, no they're, they're permanent. So they're all completely sterile and they've been designed to, 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 to last yes. for life, essentially. Thank you. Yeah, they're our gift to the patients. Um, so as well as mend vessels and open up vessels or, or tubes that are narrowed, we can also block vessels off, which we call embolization, which is um, what we do in the liver. And I'll show you these cases later on. But we use these tiny particles that we can put down to silt up blood vessels. And we can also put rather expensive sounding platinum coils, They're made of platinum, obviously, I suppose, um, that we can put in blood vessels to block them. So here's another trauma case, and I just showed you this because it's a lovely picture, if you like that sort of thing, of somebody who's been shot in the shoulder. And can you see all these little pellets? They're all the pellets from the shotgun cartridge. And now I know you're right, you'll be getting your eyes in on angiograms now, so you'll be able to see what's going on. So this is the artery coming down here, and all these little things off it, all the branches of the artery, they're all, all normal. And this little splodge, it doesn't look very dramatic, but that's, that'll be active bleeding like we saw on the last one with the patient who, was, who had a stab injury. So you've got this sort of thing. So it's, this is just a pellet that's just hit a blood vessel and ripped the blood vessel so it's actively bleeding. So we've just been able to go in with a little catheter and just block that off. And so when, you, when we take the picture again, we can see there's, the splodge is gone essentially. Has that just been reabsorbed effectively? The no, um, what, what the... The bleed itself has been reabsorbed in the second picture. The bleed it has just been stopped in the second picture. And There'll still be a big bruise there, a huge bruise, but that'll just go down over months. But all you see on these sort of pictures are what's happening in those few seconds. Right. So, yeah. So, we're talking about blocking tubes. This is a patient who had renal cancer, so kidney cancer. And if, and if you get your eyes in, you can spot that the, if you compare this thigh bone, yeah, and you look at this thigh bone, you can see there's a big black hole in that one. And not, if you look in the same place on this one, there's no hole there. So this is a, this is a metastasis or a secondary from a, ki from a kidney cancer. You can get metastases from, from liver cancer although to bones, although they're a bit uh, 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 less common. Now, the problem with these kidney cancer ones is that they're very, very vascular. They've got lots and lots of blood supply to them. Um, and so this patient, because they've got this big hole in their, in their bone, they're at risk of a fracture of that bone. So the orthopedic surgeons want to go and fix this. But because it's got such a great blood supply, there's a risk that they'll bleed and bleed and bleed when, when they go to theatre for an operation. So it's something that we get, you know, we do this probably 10 times a year at the Freeman, I'd say, is that here's my little catheter going in. So I've gone up from one leg. This is one groin. I've gone up to the aorta in the big blood vessel in the tummy, gone down the other side and got out into this little vessel. And you can see that this is, the this is essentially the same area and this thing lighting up like a Christmas tree. And there it is there, really big, angry looking thing. And then we just put some of that, some of those little particles in, and silt up its blood supply. And here it is. That's the same area. I've done. I've injected some more dye, and all of this has devascularized. So it's got no more blood supply. So it's safe for them to go and have an operation without a bleeding risk, which they did the next day. 
So I've just included this because obviously you're a liver group. So we, we do the TIPS procedures. So we, we um, do, uh, so when patients come and they have bleeding from varices or something like that, or they have dilated blood vessels relating to having cirrhosis, or they have a problem with ascites, so fluid on the tummy that, that keeps coming recurrent ascites, then we can make a little path in the liver between the supply to the liver from the gut, the portal vein, and the hepatic vein, which is the vein that drains the liver out, and that takes the pressure off the dilated veins in the tummy, and it takes the pressure off and enables the fluid that comes in the tummy, the ascites, to settle down and stop being such a problem. So that, that's one thing that we do, but I'll move on. So let me take a deep breath and we'll go for the second round with the really looking into how interventional radiology treats liver cancers, which is the second sort of half of the talk. How are we doing for time? Yeah? Fine. yeah. yeah? Halfway. Excellent. Good stuff. So cancer treatment's been traditionally um, treated in three ways. There's been radiotherapy, radiation oncology, this is broadly speaking, medical oncology, so chemotherapy, and surgical oncology operations. But recently we've added what interventional radiologists do is interventional oncology. And we call that the, the fourth pillar of cancer care because we really are involved in lots and lots of areas of treating cancers these days. Took me ages to do that. <laughs> and broadly, our treatments for liver cancers are split up into two types. So we've got intraarterial, so intraarterial liver treatments, which are the ones, the ones I alluded to before, where we go into the blood vessels in the liver and give very directed treatments towards the liver tumours. So that's the intraarterial liver therapies. And there's two sorts of those. There's TACE which is chemoembolization, so we give little bits of chemotherapy and block the blood supply. And there's also CERT, which is like a local radiotherapy treatment. But I'll run through those in a bit more detail. And the other, so that's the, the artery-directed treatments to the liver tumors. And there's also ablation, which is where we put a needle in from outside and get rid of the tumor that way. Do like a little operation without cutting the liver away. We just burn it, essentially, most commonly, a tumour. So that's, there's intraarterial liver therapies and there's ablation. So if I go for intraarterial liver therapies first. Now, just one thing I wanted to mention is that the reason that, the, that tackling tumours from the artery works well, particularly in the liver, is that liver cancers tend to be very hypervascular. They've got a really rich blood supply. And the blood supply is all from the artery. Liver tumors, blood supply is from the artery. Whereas the, back, the normal liver's blood supply is not much from the artery. It's mostly from the portal vein. So if you do a tumor from the, uh, sorry, if you do a treatment from the artery, that treats the tumor really well, but it kind of doesn't touch the background liver. So it doesn't cause much of a problem with your normal liver function. But it gets rid of the tumour well, because the tumour draws just from the artery, or nearly all from the artery. So that's the principle of, of why we do these things. So TACE is the one, um, the main one we do, and, I've, and I'd probably do about three of these a week at the Freeman. We uh, are the only centre in the north of England doing this treatment. So it's a very much a tertiary level treatment, as are all these really, all these liver directed treatments. The next um, uh, sort of uh, centre down from us really would be Leeds, Manchester and Liverpool. And north of that, until you get to Edinburgh, it's, it's the Freeman. So all these cases come through us, which is fantastic really. So TACE is as I mentioned, transarterial, so going via the artery, so we go into the groin and get a little catheter all the way up to into the liver arteries and out into the very periphery of the liver, find the tumour and just silt up the blood vessels that go to the tumour only. So it's very directed and because of that it's really well tolerated. 
and it's done under local anaesthetic, you just come, you know, it's done in an hour, it's local anaesthetic in your groin, a bit of background music and chat, it's great. Uh, and it's such a successful procedure that it, it, that it is the standard of care in patients with liver uh, HCC, so hepatocellular carcinoma, so liver cancer, um, that is too big or there's too many of them to either operate or burn with ablation. So if you've got more tumours than that, um, or the tumours are slightly larger than, than um, you could tackle with those other methods, then TACE is, is the, the standard of care, so that's the, the best thing you could have. And in, in a really good group of patients who are very fit and what have you, you can get a, a they say, 50% four-year survival, which is actually pretty good with this sort of uh, level of disease that we're talking about here. So it, do, it does well. <coughs> so the idea is, as, I, as we mentioned, that we treat the tumours as selectively as possible. So we get right out, all the way out into these blood vessels here that go to the tumour and leave all the other innocent bystander liver alone, essentially. And we inject these little tiny beads that are 200 microns in diameter, so that's 0.2 of a millimetre, into the tumour, cut its blood supply, and then out of the blocked blood vessels within the tumour leaches chemotherapy. But it just leaches locally into the tumour it doesn't, very little of it will go through into the bloodstream. So we don't have problems with that you think, oh, patients might think, I'm getting chemotherapy, I'm going to lose my hair, I'm going to this, this, this. You don't get any of that sort of thing at all. It, well, we, we don't see it. We don't see it. The risks are, 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 are very, very small. So I've just got a couple of cases to show you of this. So here is an angiogram. So here I've put my catheter into the liver artery. I'm not really seeing the, the tumour in the liver very well because you see it's supposed to be very vascular, the tumour, so it should appear and, and glow like a light bulb when I do an injection. But I know that the tumour... Sorry. Come on. Right. I know that the tumour should be here. So I put my little tiny catheter that's 0.6 of a millimetre wide all the way around the houses, all the way around into here. And then we can do some more tests. So you can do an angiogram. You can just about see a little smudge over here where the, I know the tumour is. And we do this fancy thing called the Dyna CT, which is like a CT scanner on our table. So the whole machine just rotates around and it gives me a CT picture straight away so I can see which blood vessels are supplying the tumour. It may, enables me to be very accurate in the treatment. <coughs> so this is that Dyna CT picture. And here you can see this white area in the liver. That's the tumour lighting up because all its blood supply is, you know, avidly taking up the contrast that I'm injecting. And then, so from there, I can inject these tiny little beads of taste uh, containing the chemotherapy. And they block off all the blood vessels within this and leach out the chemotherapy locally into the tumour. And then, one month later, we do a CT scan to see how the patient's got on. That's what we tend to do with all our uh, liver treatments. So we do a scan at a month to see how, how we've got on, whether we need to do any more treatments or not. And so at one month, you can, you can see that there's nothing lighting up now. It's just this dark splodge, which means the tumour's had a complete response and has gone after one treatment, which is pretty good going. And for this patient, we would then go on to scan them at three monthly intervals to make sure we don't get any recurrence, any coming back of the tumour. Here's another one showing, this is a, one of these CT scans showing a big tumour there in the right side of the liver. It's, it's bright, so it's really showing that uh, it's got lots of blood vessels. It's taken up that dye. And here at a month, there's nothing left at all. So it's just gone. Okay. Now, TACE itself, we don't say that it is a curative treatment. It's a palliative treatment. So 
What we do is we keep an eye on the patients and when if some tumour comes back or tumour pops up in another place in the liver then we go on and treat it. So it's a case of, it's not usually a one-off treatment, it's a part of an ongoing process of picking things off and keeping on top of things. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about CERT now, which is Selective Internal Radiation Therapy, which is a bit like TACE, in that we, we go through the groin. You can see here, it's quite a nice picture. We go into the groin and we get a little tiny catheter all the way up into the liver, and we inject not, um, not beads with chemotherapy, but this time we inject really, really tiny beads. So we inject between 4 and 40 million of them into the liver. They're absolutely tiny not with a view to blocking off the blood supply for things, but really just to, just to send these tiny little beads containing radioactive material, which is yttrium-90, which actually goes into the tumours, and because the tumours have got lots of blood supply, they suck up all these little beads, and then the beads kill the tumour. They kill the tumours, and because they've sucked up all the beads, then the background liver gets, gets only a very small dose, so the patients can manage. And this has worked really, really well with liver tumours, um, particularly hepatocellular carcinoma. But we use it for many, many other sorts of liver, liver cancer, and it works well. Sadly, it's not available on the NHS for liver, for hepatocellular carcinomas as yet. Although we've been able in this trust to treat patients with hepatocellular carcinoma using CERT, um, we've managed to treat about. 20 patients now, something like that. So we're doing really well. In other centres in the UK, they wouldn't, patients wouldn't be able to access this treatment. Yeah, like I say, you can treat many, many different sorts of cancer with this CERT radiation type treatment. So you've got the hepatocellular cancer, which is what we're kind of focusing on in this talk, but also cholangiocarcinomas you can treat with CERT. Neuroendocrine tumours you can treat with CERT and various other metastases of secondary tumours from like colorectal cancers and uh, what have you. In the hepatomas we've treated, our, the best patients uh, to treat seem to be the ones with very large tumours. And We've got some patients who've got an absolutely huge tumour and we've taken them to curative surgery from having the huge tumours. I'll show you some examples of that. So here's a 41 year old chap, hepatitis B, with a very, very big tumour. You can see that big blob in the liver. Yeah, Very, very big tumour, say 15 centimetres in size. Then we've got our little catheter. Is it going to work? Come on. Nope, it's not going to work. Right, okay. Well, so you can see that uh, how can videos play when you're not doing the talk and then when you do the talk they don't play? Anyway. So this shows, they've got a catheter, you can just about see, this is going to be a beautiful angiogram, so you have to imagine it. Uh, we've taken one of those tiny, tiny catheters all the way out into the liver arteries to enable us to give this treatment safely. I can't believe that. Right. And we've, done a, we've taken a picture on one of those special CTs on, on what, during the procedure, and you can see that how bright this is, that's really reflecting all the blood vessels within the tumour that are going to suck up the treatment. And here you can see, this is, the, this is before we gave CERT treatment, so it's a huge thing, and at six months it shriveled up to a little um, tiny lesion that probably doesn't contain that much cancer anymore, it's pretty well all dead, and it's really shriveled right up. And then in selected patients, then you could, Mr French, uh, interventional radiology can't quite do total or yeah, uh, liver resections just yet. But uh, you could potentially then take away a proportion of the liver, leaving enough liver to, for the patient to manage, and then they could potentially be cured, which is amazing considering the size of this thing uh, when they started out. 
And this is a patient who's had that very thing done. So this is a CT scan showing this huge tumour at the front of the liver. And then they went and had CERT treatment and months and months later it shriveled up to this little dot. And there's no, see this is all quite white and that's reflecting, it's got lots and lots of blood vessels in it. And this, there's no white in it at all. So it's basically just dead. The tumour's gone and because it's gone, it's shriveled up to be, be very, very small. And that's enabled our surgeons to remove it. So that the patient went from having a huge tumour to having no tumour, which is fantastic. And this was a patient who's 80 years old. That's great. So that's the intra-arterial therapies, which is TACE, chemotherapy beads, and CERT, radiotherapy beads. And now I'm just going to talk, how are we doing? Are you okay? Yeah, now I just want to talk a little bit about ablation, which is really, which is surgery without a knife, essentially. We're doing little resections of the liver, but without a big cut, and just a, a little tiny nick in the skin that doesn't need a stitch. So there's two sorts of ablation. There's thermal ablation, which is by far the most common, which is essentially burning. We put a little needle in and we burn the tumour um, to get rid of it. And now heat energy using burning has been around for an awful long time. Uh, this was uh, Hippocrates who said, what medicines do not heal the lance will and what the lance does not heal, heal fire will. So this concept has been around for a while but he didn't have the stuff to, to do it. We do, thankfully. So what we use to treat these tumours is, is uh, microwave energy. So it's like a, mic a little microwave oven on the end of a needle, essentially. So we have, this is the needle. And that um, works, microwave works by shuffling water molecules up and down at 2.45 billion cycles a second. And that very rapid, I can't even do it fast enough. But that rapid movement of the water molecules causes heating, and that heating is what burns the tumour essentially and cooks your ready meal. So, normally we'd just use an ultrasound to guide these treatments. So, the patient often would be asleep, so you'd have a general anaesthetic, the procedure takes about 20 minutes, and I'd use ultrasound. So, here's an ultrasound picture of a lesion just before I, I put the needle in and burnt it essentially. So here's the tumour, and then I would just put the needle into it and press, you know, 800 watts, five minutes, and uh, that would be that. And it's a great procedure. It only takes a few minutes. Patients come in, they go home the next morning. They feel a bit, it's a bit sore, the side for a few days, but compared to a liver resection, you know, it's pretty well tolerated. And it has a very low morbidity and mortality, so low complication rate compared to resection alternatives. But we can't always see these tumours with ultrasound, which is a big problem, because I want to be able to offer this treatment to patients, but if I can't see it on ultrasound, I can't put a needle in it and then we can't treat it that way. So something we've, we've developed very recently, and we're one of the few trusts in the country to be doing this, is using a very fancy ultrasound machine that can actually overlay um, a, a CT scan or an MRI scan the patient's had with the ultrasound and even if I can't see it on the ultrasound using the CT scan over, over the top of it shows me where it is and I can treat it. It's, it's good stuff. Now that machine's on loan at the moment but we've done about eight, nine patients successfully using this, this treatment and otherwise those patients wouldn't have been able to have that potentially curative treatment. So this, this patient um, has got this little blob in, in, this is their liver, this is a CT scan, and this little blob is the tumour. And it's a quite a small thing, so it's ideal for ablation, because ablation is good for lumps in the liver that are three centimetres in size or less, so quite small things. But we couldn't see it with ultrasound, and we've got an, this machine that we uh, have on loan also enables us to do contrast ultrasound so we can inject these tiny little um, bubbles 
and it will act like it's almost like a CT scanner so we can see if something has a great blood supply in the liver like a tumor and it'll light up on the contrast ultrasound so in this but in this case because the patient had a bit of a fatty liver we couldn't use that it didn't work so we still couldn't see it using contrast ultrasound so we we're really getting a bit desperate that we wouldn't be able to treat this patient so this is using the CT scanner so this is the CT scan that we showed you before and the ultrasound and they're overlaid and this is me with a needle in and we're cooking that tumour so you can see all the bubbles of gas form within the tumour as we're cooking it so you can see how that they correspond the position is exact and that enables me to give that treatment I wouldn't otherwise been able to give so just to prove it works I've got this is the before we did the ablation so you can see that little blob there and after we did the ablation there's just there's this is quite bright after the ablation this is all dark so the tumor's gone essentially so that patient would then just be followed up with scans every few months to make sure they didn't develop any recurrence of the tumor or any tumors elsewhere but he hasn't he hasn't okay so that's thermal ablation which is the vast majority of the type of ablation that we do so there's also non-thermal ablation which is pretty space age stuff and there's another thing that we're doing well with getting for the trust sorry were you no, 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 just with ah right yeah so we're one of a handful of trusts in the country who offer this service um, and it's called IRE or nano knife and we put in these little needles and we surround the tumor with little needles and they're like essentially pairs of electrodes so we surround the tumour, so imagine that's the tumour, we put these needles using ultrasound usually to guide it around the tumour and between these needles we fire short bursts of 3000 volts of electricity for a very short period of time and it's such a short period of time that you don't tend to get heating so we don't get any, any burning and the advantage of that is if you have a tumour that's next to things that you don't want to damage with heat then you can't do the normal ablation like the microwave that we'd normally do but you can do this sort of thing because it because it doesn't heat it doesn't damage the surrounding structures but the, the lights of the hospital dim slightly with each treatment <laughs> just momentarily so here you are, here's one of the cases that we did and I bet this video doesn't play either but there we go we'll see oh there we are so you can see there's the two needles in and they're flicking and each flick is 3000 volts going between those needles and but because the needles are just around the tumor it's only the tumor that gets damaged and the rest of the you know doesn't damage surrounding structures so that's a really great option for patients oh no 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 they're asleep yeah yeah they're asleep because you're firing this electricity energy then if they were awake their muscles would be twitching and they'd be doing the river dance or something yeah. while you were doing it so so they have general anesthetic and they're fully paralyzed so all their muscles are really relaxed um, to enable us to do it so that's called IRE and here's a here's a patient that we did with a neuroendocrine tumor in in the uh, liver and here's the tumor here this little bright blob at the front now he's had half of his liver removed this 28 years old half his liver removed and his, his bowel is kind of stuck a bit stuck onto the liver at the front because after an operation you can get these things called adhesions and I think he gets adhesions with his bowel stuck onto the liver at the front so you can't really it's going to be a difficult job to go and operate there I believe um, difficult job to go and operate there because everything's a bit stuck together and also you can't put a you couldn't put a microwave needle in and burn that because you'd burn and damage the bowel next to it so this is an you know an ideal case for this nano knife treatment so what we do then is put in the needles around this tumor and zap it essentially so these are these two little bright dots of the, of the needles gone in around the tumor we've used this fusion again that's come in and been really helpful there's the tumor there and we've used that because it was difficult to see we've used that to help us guide these needles in 
we've given the treatment. Afterwards, we've, done, we've injected some bubbles to have a look at the area. And we've seen that there's no, there's no um, tumour left in this zone that we've treated. <laughs> this is another video. Okay, never mind. Doesn't matter. Right, so this is the before and after shot. Uh, so this is the bright blob showing the tumours there. We've gone and treated it. And then we've done, looked at three months later and what was bright is now dark and that indicates that it's got no blood supply anymore. It's not there anymore. It's been got rid of. And so that's really got us out of a tricky situation and enabled us to give some treatment to this patient. So, let's say that interventional radiology, I think it's a really interesting uh, specialty and it's really rapidly expanding, very technology driven. And um, we've decided it's the fourth pillar of cancer care. The interventional radiologists have. And we really, we offer what I think is surgery without the knife really and it's very well tolerated on the whole. It's got very low complication rates. We can treat patients young and old. And we often do it that one of its advantages is that it's often as a day case. So you just come in the morning, have the procedure and either go home same day or the next morning. And, and because of that, patients have very rapid recovery times, which is understandable. And that is the end of my talk. <laughs> and this is what I was doing last summer. Uh, not really. You'll see in a minute. My, I showed this to my, to my daughter last night. It gets to be a ridiculously big wave. And my daughter completely believed that that was me on the oh, surfboard. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, really, Dad? Did you do that? Were you okay when you fell off? <laughs> there we are. Anyway. That's 10 year olds. <laughs> so, has anyone got any? Is it, would it be QA time now? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I mean, everybody's fascinated. I'll leave this, I'll leave this play. It, it's 20 minutes, this, you know. Uh, so. <laughs> Certainly. As it's a sort of a speciality, as you say, of this particular hospital. If, um, what's the sort of criteria or who makes decisions, say for instance, if um, there's a little tumour or any sort of tumour diagnosed at Sunderland or North Tyneside or, right. or something like that, yes. so who makes the decision? Well we have a, a regional uh, meeting that's held, held here that all the, refer the, the regional hospitals right over to Cumbria and all, ar all around we would refer in to the, a meeting in this hospital that happens every week that Mr. French runs um, where all these cases are discussed and we look at all the, the imaging, so the CTs and the MRIs and we hear about the patient's background and how, you know, their fitness and that sort of thing. Um, and then the decisions can be made from there but then the patient would, be, would come into clinic and, and discuss it and then we could go take treatment from there as it were. So that would be for the liver, but what about, say, for instance, breast tumors and... All these meetings go on for every different sort of okay. cancer that there is. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and we're lucky in that the Freeman is a big, what we call a tertiary referral centre, so I think our catchment's 3 million, is it? 3.7 million. So out of a population of 3.7 million going across essentially the whole of the north of England, mm -hmm. we get patients referred in... Um, to us to, to, to work out what treatments we can offer and make sure that patients get, you know, the right treatment and do you find for them. That hospitals engage in that or have I think Mr. F Mr. French might be yeah, yeah, I, I think so.
that is because people don't want to refer, because it's just a uh, sort of slight lack of knowledge. Really. And, and they can just they can refer. It doesn't have to. It can be referred, and the money would come with it. Right? And, you know, sort of poli I know politically, it would it, the referral could come from the hospital as opposed to going back to the GP, for instance, and money following from the GP. Yeah, so it? so it gets quite complicated because it's in the UK, or should I say, it's England, we can treat anybody, right. and then we will get money from, from a CCG, uh, which is a commissioning group. Now it comes from Scotland or Wales. We get quite a few referrals from Scotland. The, the, the philosophy is you can choose a book anywhere you like, but the new clinical commissioning groups, the latest round of uh, of uh, commissioning, they're trying to um, ring fence it with their own areas and making it more difficult for people out of the area to be referred in for free. It's a bit of an it's a bit of an annoying thing for the premium board. But well, Peter's done the selling himself a little bit. He's leading on. Um pancreatic IRE as well, so the new one into the pancreas. Yeah. There's very few centres doing that, so we, we're leading the way, but the funding's an issue, so we're getting help from pancreatic cancer in the UK for that, so, so, mm. so, so we know what to do, but we need a bit of help. Do you have the same problem um, with funding from, from Wales? Would you have to apply yeah. for funding? Yeah, it's quite interesting, because we've got a fund within the North for a man who was treated here from Wales. Yes. Yeah. And his family has been accepting years and we're currently holding four ten thousand pounds in his menu. Um he's from Wales. Yeah, they don't have well trust with the one that could be wasn't. And the reason yeah. the reason they've done it is because Newcastle gave them quotes where he actually went to Manchester and they gave him over. Um sadly died. Amazing. Uh, yeah, they're still raising money now. They've got an eBay. One of the sons has got an eBay page, and we get a proportion of everything he sells. It's a commercial organisation. Mm -hmm. that's the money. They want to go to Welsh patients. Is that what they want? Or? No, no, no. 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 To, the free, to the free. I mean, what I've said to them is that it would be nice if, you know, because you've got that much money, some people could put his name on. It's James Howard Jones, and you know, and they're not going to get anything. And, and that's why I set the fund up. And what I've said is, if something comes up, then we can use that money for a specific thing, then I'll get in touch with his widow. Mm -hmm. And if she's happy with it, then we'll go ahead with it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's worth thinking about, because we've certainly got people with expertise in sort of pilot projects that need to be you know, initiated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. No, we're all in favour of the pilot projects. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did the RETA, mm -hmm. uh, we did the Nano Life. Can I ask about the search? You said before that um, it's not covered. It's not covered by the NHS, but you have managed to treat some people. Yes. How have we done that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, there is a commissioning uh, through evaluation, which is a national thing, and there's ten centres in the UK um, that can use CERT, and it's government funded. Um, and that is, but that's for very specific indications. So that would be colorectal secondary cancers in the liver and cholangiocarcinomas in the liver. And they have to have failed chemotherapy and all this sort of thing. There's lots of ho hoops to jump through. But we're treating patients with, for that. But we're also, um, because we're involved in, in randomized controlled trials for the treatment of, of liver tumors, in particular hepatomas, um, that. Um, Leading up to those trials, um, the companies are happy, before the trials is kind of fully up and running, the company is happy to provide complementary doses of beads, uh, which have enabled us to treat all these patients, um, which considering the beads cost £10,000 a go, is pretty amazing really. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's enabled us to give these treatments, um, which uh, many of them have, patients have done really well with it. So it's a... Uh, it's an exciting treatment for the future for hepatomas, I think, CERT treatment, the radiotherapy treatment. And there's lots of these huge randomized controlled trials that are happening across Europe 
and, and in the States that are going to publish in um, the next two or three years. And I think we'll have a lot of answers about the, the, the usefulness of it for CERT. And hopefully if that all comes back as positive, which we think it's going to, um, then I think the government will like, well, I would hope then it would be commissioned. If there's enough evidence to show it really works brilliantly, then I would hope that would push uh, the commissioning groups into uh, enabling patients on the NHS to get it as standard. Patients get it though if they, if they want to pay for it. Yes, there there is. There's always that option as well. Um, <laughs> it, yeah. It's a fair question. Isn't it? it is a fair question. If we see a patient in the MBT, we say, well, we think it's a difficult one. Yeah. No. But we, yeah. Yeah. We do. We do. Yeah. Let everyone know of all the options. Essentially, and that includes that. But it, we, there's a special arrangement um, in this trust where um, we just charge for the consumer. So the the bits of kit that we use, we charge for that, but not anything else. So that's why it's that price. But uh, elsewhere in the country, it's twenty five thousand pounds. So. There's a big difference, yeah. So we just do it, you know, um, at cost price, really, just to been enable us to treat patients. Yes, are there any sort of? I mean, it seems it almost seems miraculous. But are there any drugs that are that are more side effects or contraindications to any of the things that? Uh, yeah, all. Um, every, every treatment has yeah. side effects. Every treatment has complications. Um, yeah, I mean. The well, we could tack it. Do you want me to go through each one or something? Or I think overall they're just overall they're well tolerated. I think for the taste treatments, um, so that's the chemoembolization treatments. There's a, there's if your if your liver function is very precarious and borderline, then that could make your liver function slightly worse after you've had it, and that's why we rely very much on um, the hepatologists like Dr. Reeves to make sure that, that um, patients have good enough liver function to tolerate the treatment. The other thing that's very, that's quite common, so at least 50% of patients will have some sort of um, fatigue and things for a few days afterwards. So that can range, it's called post-embolization syndrome, that can, that can range from um, feeling just a bit off color right through to feeling like you've got a mild dose of the flu. So that's, that's the thing that's most common afterwards, and I tell everybody who has it. Um, the certs, we worry about um, radiation damage to the liver, um, and we have to be very careful about that. Um, but uh, it, a lot of it's in patient selection, case selection. Make sure you do the right thing for the right patient. And the ablation, obviously, there's risks of bleeding and that sort of thing. So I know I've painted a very rosy picture. Um, but uh, anyone who comes for any of these treatments, we properly run through absolutely everything. And there are, of course, some risks that you run with any procedure. That's just how it is. Are the catheters reusable? No. What are they made from? Do you ever get kinks? I mean, this is quite a convoluted journey. Yeah, no, you, kink you, you can get kinks in the catheters. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, but they're, they're, all, they're all designed for the job. Essentially, so um, and so we have we have we have stocks of them. So one kinks, then we get another one. So we don't worry about it too much. They're not re they're not reusable. They're relatively inexpensive, um, and so they they go in the bin after each after each outing. And there's a lot risk of them moving when you put them in the vessel in the um, artery on the vein. Mm -hmm. They aren't gonna because obviously it's just a tube. For the tubes. The tubes aren't going to move. When no. In, no. Going to stay there. The tube. The, the tubes we only are use their guides really. So the tube is just it's just a plumbing thing like there's this body plumber. Yeah. So the tubes are just there. The little catheters we call them are just there to negotiate 
to get us to the place we want to be to do something. So the tubes are only there for a few minutes and then we do the treatment. So like we'd, through, the, through the tubes we'd inject these little beads or what have you. And then once that's all done, everything comes out. The tubes come out. So they're only there to take you to the place you want to be to do the job in hand. Yeah. Yeah, the, the stents, they are, um, they're amazing actually. They come wrapped up really tight so that they're thinner than, uh, I don't know, they're about, say, three millimetres wide in total. And they can spring out to be three centimetres wide once you release them in the right place. But they're, they're designed to be there for, for life. Um, they're very flexible. They try and design them so they don't break up because uh, that would obviously cause a problem. But the... It, the sort of advancements over the last 30 years in the stent design, uh, every, every year or two you get a new advancement. Um, but they're made of nitinol, which is a memory metal, um, which when it's cold, it can be formed into something very thin and straight. And as soon as it warms up to body temperature, it changes shape completely and becomes the shape of the stent. So that's why you can pack it into such a thin plastic tube and then it gets to body temperature, you release it and it pings open to, to do the job. And then, because it's obviously going to be at body temperature for forever, uh, it stays in that shape. Mm. So from the electricity? Well, I so we don't, you don't get much heating from it, so you don't get any thermal burning, which is its which is its selling point really. But because there's that um, uh, large uh, discharge of electricity, uh, even though it's only for a very short uh, period of time, there's small risks of um, changing your heart rhythm and that sort of thing. So they're very careful in that each shock um, happens is timed with the ECG, so the heart wave so it doesn't cause a problem. Although we have seen a couple of patients who've changed their heart rhythm briefly um, and gone back to, not a dangerous heart rhythm, but they've changed their heart rhythm briefly and gone back to that heart rhythm at the end, which can limit the treatment that we can offer. But uh, it's all, it's gate, it's, we call it gated, so it's timed, but each little shock is timed with the heart rhythm for maximum safety. That must have been an interesting talk, lots of questions this time. Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Uh, it's certainly different, Peter. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, really thanks. good. Um, uh, I think we're all very uh, pleased about that talk and very interested. Can we show our appreciation? Now, <laughs> well, before we make the draw, I have to present you with your Blue Peter pen, and you're far too young to remember Blue Peter, aren't you? Sadly not. <laughs> no, these people all know. I'm very, <laughs> also, this is I'm your, very pleased you think I am too young. No, that's, that's kind. So that's your poster. Lovely. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Go up on the wall of the shed. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, great. And this is your pen. Now, the pens are a rarity. Ah. They are. Uh, only consultants, well, lecturers and speakers who come to give us a talk get one of these pens. Fantastic. So you've, um, it's a bit like getting the golden gavel and you'll not know what that is. Either. You've never watched I it. I don't know I've what done. that is. <laughs> Right, I'll just uh, I'll get round to you because Joan's not going to move, yeah, and <laughs> and we'll um, wait a minute. Start again. <laughs> That'll do. It's for the newsletter. There's your pen. Thank you very much. That's so very this kind is, of you. This is uh, for Mrs. Littler. All right. Uh, it's a t <laughs> this is really <laughs> sexist, isn't it? It's a supermarket trolley joke. Oh, I'll pass that on when I get back. Uh, it's a Liver North one, though, so that's good. Oh, that's um, lovely, thanks. Um, <laughs> you do. Buy <laughs> free liver at the... Uh... Now, um, this is our numbers club. If anyone's not in the numbers club, you should be. Um, pound a week. And there's £2,500 at Christmas and £250 every meeting. So you're just a £250. That's so okay. Would you like to draw one number, please? Yeah, sure. Beated breath. <laughs> oh, there's drum roll. 88. 88. 88. Two fat ladies. Tracy Nickel. <laughs> Who? Tracy Nickel. Tracy Nickel. You've got about three numbers. All right, good. Well, we'll let her know. Thank wow. you very much. No worries. Uh, and now we have my lovely assistant. Is 18 pounds. 18 oh, very good. Thank you for the 18 people who bought a raffle ticket. 
That's, uh... <laughs> now, if you draw the first one, I'll get the winner to take the next one. Okay. Right? Yeah. These the. There's a strip. It doesn't matter. Strip. Okay. Four two one. Four two two. Four. Two, yeah. Four two one to four two five. They're in the room. Come on down, somebody. Oh no. Um, there might be mine. No one's seen that impossible. Oh, actually, that's <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well done. Well, done. well yeah. I shouldn't have picked that out. <laughs> well done. No, really good. I promise you, I did. I didn't look. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You can pick whichever one you want. They're all magnificent prizes. Well, they're prizes. They have to be the after eight minutes. Oh, that's good. all right. Yeah. You can actually eat them before eight. You know. <laughs> Well, you'll have to draw this one again. All right. <laughs> I did, actually. My daughter's mad keen on after eight. Oh, well, that's good. She'll think it's a um, red letter day when she gets um, a little <laughs> naughty trolley token under, uh, under after eight minutes. 396 to 400. Come on down, Mrs. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> She's not Mrs. Brown's boy, you know, it's Ken Brown's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. 366 to 370. Oh, 366 to 370. Okay, next to The doctors are cleaning up, look. Trying to get something wrong Thank you. Anything like any of that glittering the rear four prize. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I need some body polish actually. <laughs> 386 to 390. 386, come on another. Perfect. And you can do the rest of it because I've got one more job to do. By the way, this lady here is called Nickel. She's um, on. Uh, she's going to medical school next year and she's here to do a little bit of learning. She's mm -hmm. doing a gap year and she's working at Staples and um, Ryman's. Ryman's in the mm -hmm. galleries. Mm -hmm. um, can you put your talk on there and we'll sure. put some of the pictures in the newsletter? Sure. Is yeah, that that's right? fine. Yeah. Huh? Good man. No problem. Good. Now um, I'll tell you when the next meeting is and some other things. Alan's going to do the rest of the draw my not so lovely assistant. <laughs> uh, in the in the newsletter, this uh, this issue, there's a friend. There's uh, I've started a new series, a new um, section called Billy um, uh, Billy Venus's yeah. joke book, and this is a lad who was in the navy before he joined the fire service with me, and his jokes are absolutely terrible, and. Uh, <laughs> They're in the newsletter. I don't want to spoil them for you, but I'll give you one example. Uh, my daughter's dog has just got out and it's lost. I've been looking for it for 20 minutes with no luck. My daughter says, Dad, you've got to look harder. He says, so I shaved my head and got two tattoos. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. I'm really sorry about the very you know, <laughs> You'll enjoy the jokes. And also there's a lovely picture in the back. I don't know if you can see that. He says, the current Mrs. Venus passed out at a party, and he says, for the life of me, I couldn't find her. And she's, she's almost wearing the same dress as the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they're all nice, uh, that's a nice little part. And there's also, um, uh, let's have a look. Apart from the tributes to Tilly, which I absolutely will bring tears to their eyes, I can guarantee it. Um, I'll tell you what. This meeting, but Helen Reeves couldn't go and, and uh, Peter stepped in for her, which was absolutely brilliant. We've all really enjoyed that. We'll be back again if we don't mind. There'll be rapid advances all the time, so, yeah. you know, in a year we'll probably be all, all changed. Uh, next meeting is Helen Reeves, who, as you know, is um, an expert on hepatocellular cancer, and she'll be talking about uh, liver cancer and prevention of liver cancer. Yeah. You know, means, means and ways and means to uh, try and stave off liver cancer. No, so I that's the that. 20th of April. Sorry. Helen's um, to get together might be wrong, but I thought it would be quite good to keep the team Yeah.
father and lost his, his, his lost uh, husband last year. So he was 15. You probably know about the family Jeremy. And he, he died on the way to you know. Anyway, his, um, his brother in law uh, was a wood father. Thanks a lot. No, thanks, thanks, for, a thanks for asking. And um, Thank you, if you need any. Uh, oh, wonderful. <laughs> 